my colleagues and I have been working on a new idea about GIS, and it is that focus that I really want to uh, talk about this morning. And the focus is GIS as a platform. We can start with this, that geography provides a kind of science platform for understanding our world. It's the kind of mantra that you and I, I guess, believe in strongly. Uh, for the last four decades, GIS has made that, that come alive through quantitative geography for, for a whole range of different applications, integrating geographic knowledge into today almost everything that human people do. Um, integration is one of its major themes, the idea of integrating data, integrating models, integrating people, and through visualization, being able to communicate effectively for collaborative and cooperative efforts. I think that's the mantra of at least what I've come to understand and love as the GIS technology. It's an integrative and collaborative sort of technology. Now, the reality is this last couple of years, GIS has moved into a major turning point. It's a, a kind of new, a new step in the evolution of this technology, a rather dramatic step. When I first started working with it, we were working on mainframes, as was, I'm sure, Waldo, you were doing that, um, inventing some of the first computational uh, geographic approaches. That moved through different stages of computer platforms, computational platforms, through minis and workstations and desktops. Today, the big focus, which is, I think, transformational, is the cloud device pattern. And this, while the other generational changes moved us perhaps an order of magnitude along in terms of number of users, I now think of there being about a million GIS professionals on the planet. This step promises to move orders of magnitude in the ability to deliver geographic knowledge to all sorts of parts of our societies. The desktop server technology structure is common in most GIS organizations and certainly in the academy. That technology is not being obsoleted by the new cloud device pattern. It's being integrated into it. So a cloud <coughs> environment can link up distributed services and be made available, uh, make available geo services through desktops and other devices. That's the basic architectural principle. This pattern links GI professionals with other parts of the organization, the other 99% of professionals across an organization, including knowledge workers and executives and, in fact, the public itself. This cloud device technology pattern resembles in many ways the iPhone, iMusic, iCloud pattern where we have up and spinning 7 by 24 geographic knowledge, and I can dip into it anytime, anywhere, from any device. That, that's the fundamental notion. And it integrates in legacy or traditional geographic information that's been created. That means a GIS for an entire organization, not simply for the GIS professional or geographer behind it. This platform leverages many trends that are clearly underway. GIS itself is getting more powerful. It's easier to use. Uh, it's becoming 3D. It's becoming real time. Uh, it, it embeds all kinds of new science components. Spatial statistics are evolving faster than we can, that we can, than, than I ever imagined. And that means geospatial analytics are becoming increasingly available in organizations. And that's evolving with more measurement, uh, so-called uh, uh, big data is looming. Uh, 
big data with all kinds of tools to manipulate it and access it. Uh, and that raises certain issues, of course, of privacy and security and, and the like, data sharing. And we see that a lot in the literature, and it particularly pertains to geospatial data as, as, as well as everything else. Another trend that's moving right along, like the very first slide, is our computing platform. We're getting um, you know, faster and better. Moore's law continues to move along. But a new pattern of cloud, almost infinitely scalable, um, with new devices that access it with a whole new software pattern of apps and services is emerging. So it's not just in our field, but in all fields, actually. And this is co-evolving with science itself. Uh, it's not, I think, by mistake that what's going on in the geospatial world is affecting and being affected by new ideas in science, from modeling to mm, collaboration to the whole cyber infrastructure notion, and, and on and on. Where does this lead us, I think, is a giant step to making geospatial knowledge pervasive, a kind of platform. This platform enables pervasive access, meaning that we link traditional techniques and tools to the cloud as a publishing environment, making geographic knowledge available on any device, any time, anywhere, like we do with email <coughs> or other platform technologies, Facebook, social networking, and the like. This platform step changes the user experience from simply desktop to a whole new, uh, a new user experience. This is the little dashboard for the mayor of Boston. He sees crime real time anywhere, anytime on his iPad, and he can pan and zoom a slippy map, and it's giving him performance measurements. How, how are we doing? Is it going up or down? How is the arrow, what, 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 what direction is the arrow pointing? Is it red or green? Crafting these kinds of new user experiences are enabled by platform technology, but they still require, and they still require creative design, talent, people who understand how to create information products which are responsive to specific kinds of needs and wants. This is where the geospatial trade or profession is moving. It borrows on the very skills that were invented in cartography for user experience development and design. This platform is different than GIS as we've had it in the past which required normalization of data into a single database environment, it, it allows us to use web maps, and I'll emphasize web maps uh, as a new medium. It allows us to integrate geographic information using web maps as a common medium. And this is social media data, traditional maps, digital maps, near real-time imagery, sensor networks, expressed as web maps. Web maps are a, a kind of specification. They're an expression of geographic knowledge. You think of web maps like the sort of consumer web maps, slippy maps, sorts of things, and that's probably the way you should think of them initially, but they're much more. They're actually the triggers for integrating data or bringing data together in in the same way that we've been doing with GIS traditionally. Web maps normalize the information, and they work like this. They're fundamental to this new cloud environment. Web maps are expressed, but they're actually pointers back to distributed servers or services or cloud-hosted services. They're the kind of lightweight, very small little file that points back to the rest endpoints of services that could be central or distributed. And those web maps have been designed to be able to be used on any device. That's part of the secret. I can look at a web map like I look at email on any device, any time. And those distributed services feed the information to this environment, which supports very simple and fast visualization, of course. We've gotten used to that in the consumer sort of mapping tools 
But more importantly, I can analyze these wet maps one relative to the other. I can mash them up. I can run models on them. And of course, I'm running models back on the distributed servers or in the cloud itself. Uh, they're, not, they're, they're not that smart. But uh, I can actually even edit a web map. I'm not really editing the web map per se. I'm editing the distributed data. But the web map gives me a kind of front end or user experience to an inroad into uh, geographic knowledge. And these can be being measured and distributed everywhere uh, all at the same time. This man is walking up here. He's making me nervous. I'm OK? Oh, okay. good. He's talking to him, I guess. This platform transforms organization. This is, an, this is something I'm speaking with experience about uh, in cities or in states or in federal agencies, we often have segmented departments that have now become stovepipe little GIS departments. And they themselves struggle to bring their information together. In the old days, we would say, put a database can in the center, and everybody has to normalize their data, and then it'll be really a GIS integrated. But nobody would agree to that because they had to have common data models. Um, that meant agreement, something humans have a hard time doing in the first place, uh, and on and on. You know that story. Web maps offer a new adventure. I can serve them from whatever the data set is, and they can be nor normalized dynamically or on the fly. This means easy collaboration. So when I say this is transforming organizations, I'll give a couple of examples. In the state of Utah, the different departments in Utah are now sharing their data through this common platform of web maps. And suddenly, they're using each other's data, and they're attracted to sharing their web map data, whereas they weren't so attractive to sharing their raw data or working together. It's a whole different dynamic. Um, and I could spend a lot of time on this, but I'll just simply say there are now thousands of organizations who are starting to share their data as web maps, both within the organization, like Shell Oil. <clears throat> they went from about 400 GIS users to now about 10,000 GIS users. I mean, that's really remarkable. And they're all sharing and using and scaling up their information. Uh, these agencies, like most of the US federal agencies, many states, many cities, UNIP, uh, UN Environmental Program, the Eye on Earth program in, uh, in Europe, the e e European Environmental Agency, EEA, they're all putting their stuff in here, World Bank. And when they put it in here, oddly enough, these web maps can be shared and used so they begin to leverage each other's maps or data without committing the real data or having to cooperate very much, actually. Uh, so it's, it's very exciting to. Uh, to, to me, a kind of new SDI uh, structure. This platform, I think, and I thought a lot about what am I going to tell you, I think this in the academy will help you bring not just geography and geographic information together, but across the entire curriculum, across the entire academy. Every department is beginning to spatialize and use your technology, GIS, to visualize and analyze their data. But we don't have so much cross-cutting work going on in universities. And I think this will simplify the sharing and use across the different disciplines uh, and programs. It simplifies instruction and learning, because people no longer have to learn as much on the technology side. They just begin to use the information. Um, it means we can concentrate on geographic learning, not on the technology that enables the learning as much. Um, it means we can actually leverage and share services and, and also share, share our information and apps and build on common platforms. Um, and we can configure commonly used apps in a new way. This will create, I think, it is already creating a sharing culture which has always been hard. Um, everywhere. And it'll also simply simplify teaching of GIS as a method and as a technology. We still need authoritative source knowledge people that understand the back office. 
But this environment provides a front office experience, a consumer-like experience for the back office of science and data collection and analytics and modeling. So a front office for the back office for every office. That's sort of my funny little way of saying it. At the software level, this is what it looks like behind the scenes. Many of you are desktop users or server users. That doesn't really go away. But this diagram is meant to represent GIS as a complete system. It's like the iPad and the iMusic and the, and the iCloud wrapped into one thing. On the right is back office infrastructure, servers, the cloud infrastructure. On the left is apps and applications, desktop applications, devices, webs, working and using shared content, content about the planet. In the center is the content itself, a spinning globe of digital living data that we wire up sensor networks into, that we share servers into. And this, this, is, this is actually, I'm here to report this is actually catching on like nothing I've ever worked with in my life. This isn't a, this isn't a promising architecture. Today, we're making about 100 to 140 million maps a day. Today, in the content space, there's been about 700,000 maps shared, data sets shared, and it's active. And it's only about eight months old, Bernie? Just about that. So kind of cool. It's like a little hockey stick of use, and it connects everything we've been doing with all the new modern cloud device uh, technology. Content is an important part of this, and we learned this early. So we've been building global base maps using our users as partners, topographic base maps, street base maps, imagery base maps, elevation base maps that are just part of the cloud experience. Instead of me having to collect all the data, I just check, search, start using a base map, and I use operational overlays, my data, to to bring it together or bring my data to life, I need a base map underneath it. Um, and so we're spending tens and tens of millions of dollars on this, buying or acquiring or processing or building these base layers of data that, uh, that, are, that are saving our users a lot of time. So actually, rather than talk about it, I mean, you're probably bored with my PowerPoints, I'd rather just have Bernie actually show it. You want to show it, Bernie? Can you flip the screen to, uh, great, thanks. Thanks, Jack. Bernie is a great guy. Welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is the home of uh, GIS online. This is uh, ArcGIS.com. And uh, Jack mentioned this site's only been around for about eight months, or a lot of the latest evolutions of it have only been around for eight months. And it really is amazing when I think about that because it's come so far. I'm hoping this is not a strange site for every geographer in the audience and educator, as uh, this is a really interesting place to begin exploring the world of online geography and GIS. We can begin by taking a look at a gallery of applications, and these are chosen by Esri as some interesting featured maps. Uh, here's one that we uh, did a blog post on and uh, covered in uh, a newsletter. This explores the demographics of dog ownership. So I can look and, and visualize which households have dogs versus cats. So here's a, this is a, a heavy dog household, not so many cats, and just an interesting way to present the data and explore some geography. Uh, other things that we can find on the home site are a featured gallery of applications, and we'll explore a couple of these in depth a little later on. Here's one which provides a nice little tour of Redlands, where Esri's home is, and I can explore the, the map by clicking to advance the photographs. I can also interact uh, with the map and explore it that way, and I can also interact with the ribbon of photographs and see where those are located on the map. Now, you might think that this would require some programming skills or some expertise, but it actually doesn't. It's very easy to assemble this map, this application. What it does require is what you're involved with, which is authoritative content and crafting that with your tradecraft. Let's explore some other content. I can do that by typing in a keyword. I've typed in climate, and here's a list of uh, 1,200 results, and I can 
explore those by scrolling. I can also filter by how they're rated. So just as with websites, users can rate maps, so I can look at the highest rated map. This one happens to be a map of uh, heat wave risk of European cities, and this happens to be authored by the European Environment Agency, which Jack just mentioned. Now, they're one of the top rated uh, hits here for climate, so I can view other items that they've contributed, and I can also look at groups that they may have used to organize the items that they've contributed to ArcGIS Online. What's also interesting about this is that with each of these sources, I have access to the very detailed metadata and meta information about that. For example, when I click details, I see that the EEA has done an excellent job of documenting this source. So there's lots of information, including links. And whenever a map is created in ArcGIS Online, all the components are also saved with the map. So I can follow these links back to the originating source. For GIS uh, users, this is the ArcGIS server services directory. So this is the source, the REST endpoint for this service, which has been used and compiled into this map. So we're never disconnected from the source data, and that's something that's very, very important. Let's search for another map. And I'm going to search for an AAG map. I just made this a few minutes ago, and it's uh, number one on the list here because it's the most recent. Let's go ahead and open it. Now, I haven't gotten very far with this map, but what I did do is I added a few bookmarks just to help me along. Jack mentioned the rich content that's available in ArcGIS Online, and that begins with base maps. So here's one of our base maps, and this we consider a crowdsource base map. It's a GIS crowdsource base map because as I zoom into areas, the contributions come from GIS users all over. At this scale, it's federal government users. As I keep zooming in and we get to the very detailed data, what we'll discover is that the data is actually coming from the GIS folks at the city of Washington, D.C. So this provides the authoritative substrate for us to do our work upon. We can go just about anywhere in the world and see similar levels of detail. Here I am in Hong Kong, and as I zoom in, you'll see this very detailed data from the Hong Kong GIS department. Now, this is slightly different. You'll see it has labels in, in different languages, but the cartography is similar. We use a template which allows us to take this data from a variety of different sources and kind of bring it all in the one map. Let's visit uh, yet one more city. Let's go to Redlands. And here is the home of Esri. As I zoom in, you'll see the Esri campus. This is one of many different base maps that we have. And here's a base map gallery that lets me choose other choices. So here's a streets base map. Here's a base map of imagery. So I can zoom in and explore the imagery in detail. I also have an open street map. I have a National Geographic style base map, which I can also view. So all these are available to me here that I can use at any point in time. Let's zoom out a little bit further. So that's our base maps, and uh, let's begin by painting some operational level layers on top of this. I consider this the canvas upon which I'm going to be doing my real work. And I can do that by searching ArcGIS online, and let's begin by looking for some interesting bits of information. I type in a keyword, I've typed in soils, and I can get a preview of what that might look like with a little preview of what that map is about. So I can see that this is a Sergo map from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service. I can view the details like we looked at before, or I can just go ahead and add it to my map. So that quickly, I've created a mashup. Now you can see that this soils layer has covered my map, and I have a couple of options now in styling this a little further to make it a better presentation. I can adjust the transparency so that we can see the base map part we threw it, or I can choose yet another base map. This is a special base map which lets me paint that layer on top of terrain, but beneath the labels on top. So very quickly, we can create a very nice looking map. Now, uh, soils is only one of the many different types of data that we can add to the map. Um, let's take a look at yet another. Let's search for some demographic layers. So I'll type in the word demographic and we get a long list of layers that match if I spell it correctly. So there we go. And uh, here's our list of demographic layers. You can see there's lots to choose from. Uh, let's add the USA Diversity Index. I'll preview it, and then I'll add it to my map. And now I get a very interesting display that helps me understand diversity throughout the United States. In this area, this is a predominantly white population. If I zoom to another part of the United States, 
Let's see what the diversity is like there. Well, this is a little bit more diverse, still predominantly white, and so forth. So you can just continue to explore the map and these pop-ups present that attribute information behind the scenes in a very visual and effective way. Let's continue on with our map and let's look at some dynamic data. So the layers I've shown you so far are fairly static. They don't change very often. They're updated every now and then. But weather, of course, is a very dynamic piece of information. So I've connected to a service which provides us the live Doppler radar, and this is updated every 10 or 15 minutes. And I can see there's a pretty big storm here in the upper Midwest. Let's add yet another layer from the weather service, and what this provides is the weather watches and warnings that are happening right now. And as that pops into my map, I can see there's a lot of watches and warnings here, and this happens to be a winter storm warning, and I can follow a link, and I can go right to the National Weather Service source for that, and I can read that uh, this is a winter storm warning that remains in effect until Thursday. So big storm in that neck of the woods. Let's turn off these layers and let's go to a little more local area. I'll use one of my bookmarks and we'll visit Louisville, Kentucky. Now Louisville is a city which floods every now and then. I'm interested in learning more about that. Uh, let's um, type in the word FEMA and I get the FEMA 100 year flood zones which I can add directly to the map. We'll add that to the map and I will do some additional refinement to what they've published. I'll turn off the information about the counties that have or have not flood information and here's my flood areas. I'll do some additional refinement and make a little bit of a transparency so I can see uh, the areas that are impacted by that flood. And of course, I can always change my base map and look at the, the imagery here underneath the flood zones. Let's do something even more interesting. Let's grab a local file I have. This is a spreadsheet of traffic cameras throughout the Louisville area. How do I map the spreadsheet? It's as easy as drag and drop. Uh, there's my spreadsheet now dragged on the map. I happen to have lat longs so that they are mapped very quickly and I can also map those using addresses. Let's change the symbols, make this a better map. I can do some thematic mapping, but in this case, I am just going to choose a single symbol since these are all traffic cameras. We'll choose a camera and apply. And I've already got a little better map than when I started. Here's the information. It's, some of the information doesn't make sense to me. Um, but I do have some interesting things here like a link to a snapshot from the live camera. What I can do is style the data along with styling the map and make that a much better presentation. I do that by configuring the pop-up. Let's add a pop-up title. We'll use the description. Instead of displaying all those attributes, we'll turn that off and I will do something a little clever here. I'm going to add the text, tap to view larger photo. And in the pop-up window, I'm going to choose that link field. That was the camera, snapshot from the camera. And when I click on that, we'll pop up a larger version of that. And let's save the pop-up and see what we have. Now I have a much better representation of all that information that was contained in the spreadsheet. There's the snapshot from the live traffic cam. And when I click, I see a larger uh, photo of it. So very quickly, I've compiled lots of different data into my map. And I'll go ahead and save it. So with this, let's pause here for a moment and I'll turn the podium back to Jack and we'll build upon this map a little later. The focus in his little demo was all about looking at and exploring this 700,000 layer data set. Bunch of maps being added to a lot. He was one of tens of thousands of users hitting that cloud environment at the same time, making these hundred or so million maps a day. Interesting context. He was primarily operating with something called a web map. And I told you that a web map can be viewed. You can also run analytics on a web map. The sort of heart and soul of what we've been talking about in GIS for dozens of years. But before we leave the simple visualization, I want to hit an important point. These web maps can actually be embedded. They can be embedded in a website or they can be embedded in a blog, or I can email them to you. They're kind of like, G, like a different kind of Gmail. Um, they can be embedded actually in something called a story map, which Alan Carroll, one of our colleagues from the National Geographic, has been building. He's been building story maps every week on some subject, and as a result, building templates to build story maps. But following this diagram, I can take those story maps and put them into 
uh, storybooks, ebooks. And the interesting part about the story map and the storybook is that the maps remain alive. So I can pan and zoom. I turn the pages, I pan and zoom, I query, do everything that Bernie was showing with a web map. So think a little bit further. I can actually make a online atlas of the world just by simply assembling the, the thousands of base maps or, or maps or content maps, soil maps, geology maps, demographic maps, weather maps, tweet maps, uh, whatever, and tell a little story. I can walk around with my iPad with my daily brief. The president gets his daily brief. Uh, the head of FEMA has his daily brief. It's actually his idea. I want a daily brief of what's going on with Sandy, but I don't want it daily. I want it moment by moment. I open up my web, I turn my pages, and, and you know, I'm not just looking at an e-book with static content. No, it's, it's alive with maps. And thinking ahead a little further, this drops right into online curriculum so that I have a curriculum. Um, I have e-books, lots of different books, both uh, and geography books. Well, you get the idea. These story maps are becoming very popular. Alan, when he makes one, tells a little story, and he does one of these every week. He just did one here on Los Angeles as a tourist story for you guys. You can, if you want to take a trip around, there's Bernie, I'll show it to you. And uh, each time he builds one of these story maps, he also makes available his template. So you can throw his data away, pour your own data in, and author your own book or story or briefing very quickly. And there's tons of them, as I mentioned. Well, I'm talking about geography and GIS as a platform delivering services with apps that I can download and use, like the storybooks or viewing apps or analytic apps, with tons of global content, the ability to easily make maps, like Bernie was doing with the spreadsheets, or there's tons of other little tools, the ability to share my knowledge, and also use something that's now emerging called cloud services. I'll just call it that. For data management, I can use the cloud to manage my data. I can use the cloud not only to visualize my data, but to do geoprocessing on it, transform it, um, do spatial analysis, do modeling in the cloud. And increasingly, we've wired this up so I could bring in real time, like real time big data, like the weather, of course, but social media, for example, or where are my trucks or where are my people, and process that in the cloud and make it available through this language of web maps. This system, by the way, just before we go any further, is open. It's open at the bottom. Any server can plug into it. And it's open at the top with APIs. We can wrap the APIs with any software product or embed it inside of anything. So it's been purposely designed to be a, an open system. The apps that are available now, well, it's gro they're growing very rapidly, but these are a few mapping apps temporal mapping apps, query apps, editing apps, mashup apps, as Bernie has showed, um, 3D apps using something called web scenes as opposed to web maps. Um, and we'll show you some of the analytics that are emerging this quarter uh, to, do, to, do, to do GIS uh, processing in the cloud. And they also run on all sorts of devices that support, again, viewing and editing and field data collection. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we released a field data collector that just downloaded from the web. I go out and I'm collecting my data, whether it's grasshoppers or, or crime observations. They're going into feature classes in the cloud, and somebody else might be looking at the app right next to it here, which is a dashboard app, which shows me in real time where, where, where the field collectors are or aggregations of their information dynamically. In other words, real-time GIS, not just real-time GIS data, but real-time uh, processing. This, this has been engineered with a new technology. We call it the GeoEvent processor, which takes very large volumes of streaming data, like, like tweets or like a thousand trucks at the same time, reads them into what we call a GeoEvent processor, and I can do geotriggers or geofencing, looking at proximity or aggregation problems, and then spit it out as results to 
in an email like this guy's getting close to you or this truck is about to arrive there or you're getting in a dangerous area or all the LBS kinds of functions that people have written about now implemented in the basic GIS environment. So I, I think maybe again the best way to really understand these apps and real-time stuff is and analytics is, is to have Bernie really show it. So you want to do that? Flip back, uh, Bernie. All right, thanks, Jack. So um, at Esri, a web map is more than a map in the browser. It's a specification, and that enables its use in many different ways on many different devices and in many applications. In fact, it's even a building block if you're building custom applications. When we left off a few moments ago, I just saved this map, and now this map is available to me, and I can come back to it at any time. But I might want to share that and make it more widely available. So here I've checked the box to make it available to everyone. I can also organize it in different groups, and groups can also hold private conversations over maps as well. One of my options now that I've shared this publicly is I can click this button to embed this in a website. Let's explore that for a moment. Um, I'd like to put it in a blog post, and I know that my blog is 720 pixels wide, so I'll make that change there. I'll add a zoom control, I'll add a scale bar, and we'll go ahead and um, we'll show the legend as well. So to put this in my blog post, very simple, I just copy that. Here's my blog. I'll click and add a new post, and let's call this my uh, Louisville uh, cams, and simply just paste that in there and go ahead and publish it. So what's interesting about this is everything that we've done, all of my, all the layers that I've added, the way that I've configured them, any scale dependencies, how the pop-ups are configured is preserved and now I have a live map that's in my blog post or it could be my website and I have that capability of clicking the pop-up and looking at how we've configured that information. And this is used by lots of different people in lots of different ways. Uh, for example, here's an embedded map that, was, that appeared in smithsonian.com. And as I zoom down, here's a, an embedded map which provides some information about the history of Louis Armstrong's travels and his, his younger days. You know how to create these pop-ups already, and you know where this map came from as I zoom in. You'll recognize it as that world topographic base map that we looked at earlier. Uh, here's yet another example. This is a very interesting one. So this is a online web application which embeds live maps, which lets us explore healthcare. So as I move to different maps, I can click and interact with the map. I can zoom in and zoom out and learn more about those. So you can embed maps easily in a variety of different applications that can become live and anybody can explore those. Another very interesting thing that I can do with these maps is I can create web applications with them. And in the past, that used to mean having to build or having to program, be a programmer yourself. But now with the magic of this web map ecosystem, I can build custom configured web applications very quickly. Uh, here's an example. This is a Twitter application which provides a connection to tweets. I'm opening up my Louisville map in there. And let's see if anybody's complaining about uh, traffic at the moment. So I type in the keyword, the tweets pop in my map, and as always, I have to apologize just in case I click and open something unfortunate. Uh, but look, so there's the traffic jam with honkers there and uh, so forth. So that easily, I've been able to kind of pull in a different kind of feed and add more context to my map. There's many other kinds of templates that you can explore. Um, this map I dealt with flood. Here's one that includes some additional GIS capabilities behind the scenes. What this allows me to do is use a, a tool to digitize a line across the map, and when I'm finished digitizing, it generates a terrain profile from that map. No programming involved. All I did is some easy assembly of the map to create that, and there's many other different examples. Uh, one of my favorite ones is this one, which lets me compare a couple of maps side by side. Now, this one right now is not so interesting because I'm looking at the same map, but all I need to do is author another map, and then I'm able to look at two maps side by side. I've made two versions of that Louisville flood map. One uses the imagery background, one uses that world topographic base map. And you can see there's a very effective way to look at this. There's other uh, examples that we can take a look at. Here's a storytelling template. Jack talked about storytelling. And this is a rapidly growing area. This provides a little introduction with the graphic and then allows me to explore the map. 
And there's lots of these examples that can be found on the Esri Storytelling with Maps website. That's storymaps.esri.com. One of the story maps that we built for this conference is this one. This is a, what's called the Los Angeles Shortlist. I can explore the map and you can see as I zoom in the contents that are categorized by areas or landmarks or campuses change based on my geography in the map. I can click on these to find out where they are and I can click and get additional details which includes links to their websites. So there's lots of very interesting things that we can look at with these story maps and many different examples that users have created on their own. You can visit this website and these are ones done by Esri. Here's an interesting one that includes uh, some time-enabled data. So these templates are also meant to work with time-enabled data. This shows the spread of a disease that's impacting bats in the U.S. over time from 2006 to last season. And uh, this is possible because the counties are stamped with the date that allows us to play them back in this form. So this is an interesting place to go and explore things. But we've worked with maps that uh, do some interesting things and allow us to bring in information. But where we're taking this is to the next level, which is really analytics. Uh, one of those places that we can begin to look at this is in 3D. So here's one of those 3D web maps that Jack had talked about. This happens to be the Esri campus. Here we've created some bookmarks and I can take a virtual tour of the Esri campus by allowing it to animate through all those different bookmarks. Here's a view from afar and we'll zoom in and take a look at one of those buildings. Now what's also interesting is that this map has some additional features with it. As I zoom in, I get an idea of what the building might look like. This is really great for geo design, uh, but I also have some comments. So I can, people can post comments, they can collaborate over these these 3D representations of cities and landscapes, and they can do more and converse more over maps with those. Jack talked about big data, and let's talk about that right now. Now, when Hurricane Sandy hit, it created some, a big problem in, in Manhattan with power outages. And what I'm playing is a, these are tweets that happened during that outage, and uh, they're being played back through the ArcGIS uh, geo event server that Jack mentioned earlier. You can see there's a lot of them happening and uh, again I'll apologize just in case we run into something unfortunate here but you can see these tweets are, are just happening all over. Now social media is full of constant information. How can we make a little more sense out of this? One of the ways that I can do that is I can begin by aggregating those tweets into grid cells. So we'll go ahead and do that and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, calculate some statistics. We'll sum up the number of tweets that happen in each cell and represent those on our map. So the map will change color based on how many are happening in each cell, and you can see that also display along the bottom. But so what? This stuff happens all the time. What's really interesting would be if we can identify anomalies or something outside the normal realm of what we would expect in the Twitterverse to be happening in our map. And indeed, our um, Washington, D.C. R&D Center, Andrew Turner's here in the front row, has been uh, working quite a bit with big data and finding ways to allow us to harvest information in more meaningful ways. So in this case, what we're doing is we're looking at tweets that fall outside the realm of the normal expectations of conversations people would be happening. And those areas are the ones that are now being lit up. Uh, this conversation happens to be mostly about power in Hurricane Sandy, and Hurricane Sandy knocked out power throughout Manhattan during that time. So this is a way of visualizing that. Another really, really fascinating area that we're just beginning to open up is the area of landscape analysis using image services that are dynamic and let us do analysis on the fly. What I'm looking at here is a map which represents the composition of various factors. So my elevation factors are here and they're weighted at 25%. Here's my slope that's weighted at 25%. Here's my aspect at 25 and my land cover at 25. Let's bump up the land cover to 50% and let's make some other adjustments here. We'll knock this down uh, to 15% uh, and I'm still 15% over things. Let's knock this down to 10% and there's my 100%. That quickly, that the results have been recalculated on the fly, and as I zoom in, 
we'll see increasing levels of detail as this becomes more refined and more resolute. So this is sampling on the fly and compositing all these different layers. Now an interesting thing that I can do here is, here's a Mona Lake and this is at the top of the Owens Valley in California and geographers know that this is an area where there's not a whole lot of water but there's water being pulled from Mona Lake on down. As I look at my analysis, according to my current parameters, what I might discover is that there's some areas which match my criteria best, which are here in dark green. What I'm able to do now is sketch those areas, and I can begin by outlining those quickly. And I might want to set this land aside as a reserve, because this is a dry area and this happens to be a nice riparian habitat. I can hide my analysis and I can refine the polygon that I've created here. So for example, I can drag out the vertices so that they match the borderline here between California and Nevada. So I can further refine and delete vertices and things like that. And you can see the composition of the map, who has contributed to this conversation about this geo design that changes as I add different things. And we'll see that pie chart change on the map as we do that dynamically. So this is the future of GIS as it moves online. And with that, I'll turn things back to Jack. Yeah, th thank you, Bernie. The, what he failed to, yeah, it's good. What he failed to mention is what he's hitting is a database of 500 pieces of information for the entire United States, which is all in the cloud. So we've taken elevation, slope, geology, vegetation, land cover, ex uh, property ownership for federal lands, and put them in the cloud. Then being able to do manipulation of those layers dynamically with this raster analysis, then being able to do geo design on top of it. I just wanted to go back through that because it's, it's a remarkable um, capability that I've never, I mean, I dreamt of this when I was still at Harvard. We'd think about, ah, oh, if we could just plan out the country better, but we'd need geographic information. That's absolutely what got me into this. You wanna turn back the other slide? So we're starting, we're starting to see that actually come alive. So I guess in conclusion, I wanted to say, look, GIS for me in all of my history of working with this, it's dramatically changing. I just get quivery about it. It's at a major turning point. It's gonna become a platform like other platform technologies and social media, meaning it's open, extendable, um, and, and reachable by everyone in organizations everywhere. That's gonna enable the broad scale uh, reach of geography to go, to go much further. That's kind of how I would, I guess, summarize it. So, GIS as a platform is worth thinking about. It means we will transform geography in the applied sense, particularly to understanding the world. That means wiring up the world. It means real-time services. It means all of the data available to us, not simply us gathering all the data ourselves. It means applications like the geodesign application that brings geography into designers' hands, into decision makers' hands. It means web books like the one on, on Medicaid spending. That one was built for the Senate, so briefing to the Senate. It means storybooks for the president, for all executives. It means real-time geography. And uh, that, that means, I think, geography gets transformed. It gets pulled into many places. But at the same time, we need to, Im we need to make darn sure the science itself is sound. So it isn't just like flying around like Superman on a map, it's grounded in authoritative source and sound science that serves it up into those spaces. What does that mean? I, I think it's worth a conversation and that's the purpose of this meeting, I suppose, is to talk about these new things. For me, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. So that's, I think, Bernie, did you want to say anything else? Hmm? Nothing else? Nothing else. Okay, we're done, thank you. <laughs>
and it's a major area of research for geographers to make sense of what this is going to mean for us all. Thanks to both of you. This is very innovative work.